How's your morning going, Pacific? You're going to lurk? Okay. Did you go get your samples yet? Nice. Have fun. I'm probably going to cut off the uh, stream at exactly three or maybe a little bit earlier today. I don't know. I have uh, I have an appointment at three fifteen with uh, some students. So. Hi everybody, I'm on the SCM today, I'm in the lab, I'm ready to go. Um, my objective for today is to get some images for a student poster and normally I would have the student along. But, um, I, d I think she has class right now. Anyway, the poster sort of got, uh, expedited. Things had to be moved forward very quickly. So I was planning on doing, um, some of the image collecting with the student a few, like next week or something but it turns out the poster needs to be submitted by today. So, um, hey, Andalore. So, um, had to sort of speed things up and I had Mallory make me some samples from the stubs and here we are. So, um, this sample is from the Wabash River, which is a river that runs right next to you know, right through Terre Haute, basically, right on the edge of town. And so it's close to campus. And it's kind of an interesting um, uh, issue. We collected a core. I actually didn't go out to the, do the field work for this one. Um, in the fall of this past year, and um, actually some students went out and did the coring. And then uh, normally you can't core in a river. And, or you can, but it doesn't usually have very good results. Um, but this site's sort of an exception and it's a pretty interesting one. So um, in any case, I'm looking for diatoms for from these samples to collect some images for the poster. So I thought I would start with this Cirrella that we have here. And um, let's see, that's a diatom. Um, and 
uh, we're just zoomed very closely in on it. Uh, when we started, we were something like 90,000 times magnification. And right now we're about 50,000 times magnification. So the SCM has the power to allow us to uh, get very close. And um, so I was zoomed in. I was just trying to get my focus nice and tight before we started. And now I'm going to zoom out so you can see the entire diatom. Um, in the old days, this would be called um, somatopleura. And I think it uh, used to be called somatopleura. Pleura cilia, um, but because it got shifted to um, the genus Cerarella recently, like um, in the last 10 years, um, it also had to uh, use an old name. So sort of an interesting uh, diatom in that it, it got moved into the genus Cerarella and then at the same time got uh, got an entirely new name, including the species name, as some sort of a quirk with the way that things work. Um, so I'm just trying to image it, and um, that requires me to turn the camera. I'm actually just turning the stage. Um, and I'm trying to get it to 45 degrees like it is here, or close to it so that we can zoom in and I can get the entire image corner to corner. Like so. Um, this is a pretty diatom and it's relatively clean. Um, and I get the focus real tight like this. Uh, we've imaged this uh, diatom or one very similar to it previously from a number of different places. It's probably one of the um, one of those diatoms that we think of as being cosmopolitan, which just means you can find it in a lot of places. You can find it anywhere. Um, that's kind of what cosmopolitan means. But um, when we say cosmopolitan with respect to diatoms, we just mean that it's got a wide distribution. So. Um, they've seen this species in a lot of places. I don't know if it's exactly the same. Um, it could just be something that's very closely related to it, but, um, but it's kind of common. Um, and it's going to make for a nice picture for the poster. So uh, you can find these in lakes. This particular sample, as I mentioned, is from um, the Wabash River. And I'm going to talk a little bit about like why we could collect a core from the river, which is actually part of the reason um, that uh, the whole project is sort of designed around. And um, I have a student um, in my lab, Mary, who I don't think she's ever been on, um, on the Twitch stream. She's an undergraduate, but she's coming back as a graduate student next year um, in my lab. So this happens occasionally. Um, I would say maybe a third or a quarter of the students who come into my lab as undergraduate research and do undergraduate research with me will return at some point to do usually master's level research with me. And um, so they come here for grad school as well. And um, so Mary will probably take on this project, which should be a pretty interesting one. So I think this is going to be a pretty good picture. It looks like everything is set. And you can see a lot of the detail um, in the surface. So uh, the surface of this Cerarella is undulate. And you can tell that because there's sort of a dark patch here and a bright patch here and a dark patch here and a bright patch here and a dark patch here. And so um, hopefully your eye transitions that into uh, light and dark patches as a result of a wavy sort of surface and that used to be sort of the characteristic that separated Submetapleura from Cerarella but um, there were a lot of Cerarella that also had similar structures and so they decided it wasn't uh, a reasonable feature to um, separate a group on and 
Eventually, they decided that there wasn't a lot of features that they could use to clearly, at least at this point, distinguish Cervarella from Cimetopleura. So, um, so they just lumped them back together for now into one group, Cervarella, which is the older one. So I'm going to go ahead and go ahead, uh, collect that image, and I can come back and see what's going on, if anything, in chat. Oh, hello, Mama Bon Bon. Hopefully you're doing well. Um, so this um, sample, as I mentioned, is collected from the Wabash River. And um, rivers are what we call transient. In other words, um, with respect to sediment, most of the sediment in a river is basically bypassing sites. In other words, it's being trans transported from one location to another because the water's flowing and um, silt-sized particles, which is what you know, rivers are dominantly composed of, um, in at least in this section of the country, um, they, they don't require a lot of energy to start moving particles. So if the water is flowing, it's very hard for sediments to be deposited in a river system, um, or they'll get set down for short periods when the water is flowing a little bit more slowly, and then when the water picks up again the next year, or maybe during a flood or something else, what will normally happen is the sediments will then just get picked up and mobilized again. And so um, an advantage that you can have is that in some places the water is relatively calm. Um, and, and so occasionally you'll have some areas where there's enough slow moving water that you create these sort of pools where sediments can accumulate. However, that's not the case with this particular sample. This sample was actually collected in um, uh, one of the more fast flowing parts of the river, but it happens to be that um, uh, there used to be a bridge that went across the river there, and at some point in the past, uh, there was a train supposedly on the bridge that collapsed. And when the bridge collapsed, it basically dropped the train or parts of the train into the river and they were never recovered. So um, the, the, the cars of the train, parts of it basically stayed in the river system and they weren't able to get it out. And um, what this did then, at least in theory, is created a sort of a baffle where when the water flowed by, couldn't erode the sediments in that particular part of the river. And instead what would happen is on the backside of the train, sediments would accumulate. And so um, in sort of exploring this idea, uh, students from our department went out in yeah, a haunted train car, uh, went out to the river and then uh, took a coring device and, um, and collected, I think they're maybe like 40 centimeter long, half meter cores um, that were collected from the backside of where the train was, where the sediments are basically um, accumulating. So uh, one of the things that's really nice about that idea is uh, it allows us to see um, where things have happened in the river system. It actually accumulates a record where we would not normally be able to see a record. So um, that's kind of cool. And it allows us to sort of explore the history of a river system through the sediment records because those would normally not be preserved. Um, it actually gives us some insight um, over the sort of long history of that um, environment and how it might have changed. And while that's um, really useful for us because uh, that there's not really a record of the river and its history directly. And also the Wabash River, because it's located in the sort of farm country uh, and an area that used to have a bunch of industrial pollution, it's actually providing us a lot of insight or potentially providing a lot of insight into what's happened in that river system over the last hundred years or so, which is what we think the record is probably uh, recorded from when the train cars collapsed in. So um, it 
will give us basically two bits of information, um, well, and many different parts, but some idea of what happened to the river over time. And two, we think that the water quality for the river has probably improved since the Clean Water Act and um, a number of the environmental polluters are no longer there uh, in, you know, along the river system. So we think that we could actually look at changes in water quality over time by looking at things like the diatom uh, fossils that are recorded in those cores. So we're hoping to do some geochemical analysis on the sediments and then also um, analyze the, the diatoms from the system. And if the record is continuous and it provides us a complete story, it will be really nice because it will allow us to basically figure out like is this really the case? Has the quality of the water improved? So, All right. so I just needed to put a label on that one. I think that one will probably be one we could put on the poster. So um, the intention for this uh, work that I'm doing today on the SEM is to actually collect images for a poster and um, the poster will then be uh, used, um, presented at uh, the National Council for Undergraduate Research. And our abstract for that has already been submitted, I believe. Um, and the poster needs to be um, uploaded early, like very early. So um, the plan is to try to get that done today, basically have the entire poster completed. And um, and then these images will go on that poster, or some of them will, at least. So, and hopefully provide us some, eventually some insight into the species that we're seeing in the river system. So it's kind of hard to get this little tiny guy in focus um, at a slow speed. I think you can see um, some Mantaphotoporchula here and here, and I think there's one under this boulder, <laughs> a silt-sized boulder, and another Mantaphotoporchula here, and then a Rimaporchula here. So um, I'm just going to zoom in and uh, try to get a good look at this thing so we can get it in focus. Um, you can see there's a central tube for the Mantaphotoporchula. It's just a process on the diatom. And then there's two satellite pores, which are basically these little slit-shaped holes that have coverings over them. And on the inside of the diatom, this is the way that it appears. I'm going to just see if I can tweak the settings a little bit to make it a better image. It may not, we may not be able to improve it any from there. It may be at its sort of best conditions. I don't know, maybe that's a little bit better. Um, and then um, now that we have it in focus, I will zoom out a bit. And then we can get an image of this one as well. So river systems... Um, uh, like this are composed like in the water column are mostly composed of things like silt as I mentioned they're very easy to mobilize and diatoms are in the silt size fraction so in terms of sizes what we're looking at this diatom is only about 5 microns across um, and that's sort of on the small end of the silt size fraction so um, so it means that everything we're looking at in the diatom record is roughly the size of the rest of the particles in the sample. Yeah, so it um, should be pretty cool. And um, we're still in the early stages of figuring out like what's going on with the poster, um, what's going on with the research from the site. But um, it's always nice to have uh, a few pretty diatom images that we can stick up on the actual uh, poster so that um, People probably don't know what diatoms are, and it'll give them a chance to sort of see that. So, I'm 
you can see a lot of the detail from um, from what I was doing the central tube is this middle one that looks a little bit like a tire valve and then uh, these two slit shaped things on the sides um, that are associated with it and uh, You'll note I didn't give this thing a name. Um, I suspect it's a stephanodiscus, but I'm not totally sure. Um, it looks like there's biseriate uh, stri, um, but there's also some sort of a ridge right here. And these sort of like costy like ridges are not common for stephanodiscus, so that means it's probably cyclostephanos rather than. Um, stephanodiscus but I couldn't really see the central area to see what was going on here so I didn't want to put a name on it um, my guess is that it's a cyclostephanos though now that I've had a chance to sort of see some of the details um, it's extremely small so um, you know a bit of a question mark but you can see the rim of portula and the mantle foot of portula at least two of them and then the center has some sort of a dimple-like structure on it, so um, we could probably figure out what this is. Oh, it could be a discostella, actually, because it looks like the uh, the mantle photoportula are actually between costi, and that's the case here as well, and then also the rumoportula is between costi, um, and that's actually a characteristic of a discostella, and the really little discostellas um, are kind of hard to tell what's going on with them. So um, this flat central area with no striae means it's not cyclostephanos. Um, and the presence of those things between actual costi suggests that it's a discostella to me. So pretty quickly figured out what it was. I don't know the species off the top of my head, um, but there's a bunch of little tiny discostella that are hard to tell what they are. Um, while we're on the topic of Discostella, so this is the internal view of a Discostella. I'm just going to call it tiny for now. Um, uh, I just had a paper published today on Discostella in North America. Not this species, but uh, Discostella astera castata. And um, we actually found that species, Astera castata, which isn't this little guy, but another one in the same genus, in the Wabash River. And um, we've talked about it before in here as an invasive species, so that paper finally got released today. So kind of excited about that. Um, again, that was some student research that went on in my lab. And so um, started off as a, I was uh, out, um, on the Wabash River doing a little kayaking uh, one day when I first got here. And uh, we collected some samples, some diatom samples from the river just to see what was in there because um, I thought, oh, it'll be interesting to kind of check out the, the water, see what's here. Um, and it's when I'd first moved to Terre Haute. So this is the fall of 2012 or maybe, yeah, I think it fall of 2012. Um, so I just brought some plankton nets with me and collected some samples and then um, uh, shortly afterwards processed them and looked at them in light microscopes and um, we found uh, this Discostella that didn't really belong um, in North America and when I figured out the species it was actually supposed to be in Asia so um, I was confused by that and uh, we mentioned it and um, talked about it with another colleague who also found some in Arkansas. And uh, together, we decided that this was uh, something that we should consider publishing. So uh, we started looking at it and then um, trying to figure out what its distribution was in North America and why nobody had actually observed it before. And we think it's an invasive species. So uh, that's the sort of short version of it, the long version of it, you could read in the paper that was published today if you're interested. Um, I've posted links to that paper and another one that came out today that I'm also a co-author on from uh, the occurrence of um, a, a 
different genus, uh, Semiorbis, in North America. So this little guy right here that we're seeing is not a diatom, but rather is a pollen grain. And this is pine pollen. Pine are very common, and their pollen are uh, super abundant in all kinds of aquatic systems. Um, and I don't analyze pollen typically, but we definitely see them on occasion. Um, and I can recognize some of the genera. So um, pine pollen, usually people call Mickey Mouse because it has like one central, uh, like, you know, Mickey Mouse's head and then the ears, basically. Um, in this angle, it's not completely clear that it looks like Mickey Mouse, but I've seen it in the SEM before enough to know that that's a pine pollen. So. Yeah, it would be nice if we could um, take some of the uh, larger grains and just get them out of the way, but um, it's not really an option. Uh, I could poke them a little bit with a micro manipulator um, after the fact, uh, but it's hard micro manipulating things that are this small, um, even to be able to see them in the, um, a type of microscope where I could poke at it and then to be able to actually move particles without destroying the diatoms is kind of a challenge. So uh, just usually leave them on there and deal with the fact that, you know, things aren't always perfect. So um, I will take a picture of the pine pollen just for fun. Um, it might be something that we would want to include in an analysis, uh, pollen, I mean, but probably pine pollen's not going to tell us a whole lot. So, uh, you know, we already know there's pine here. Um, but it's sometimes nice just to collect some images of other things that we find in the sediments uh, in the record and to have some image of them for training for students so that I can show them what pine pollen looks like. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. This uh, large bouldered thing here is a sand grain or a silt grain. It's probably still in the silt uh, size fraction. Um, but you can see it's quartz. So our image is being collected at 5,000 times magnification. And as I've mentioned before on the stream, a typical upright light microscope usually has, if it has a 100x objective and 10x eyepieces, it usually has a maximum magnification of about 1,000 times. Um, you can enhance that. You can enlarge it by putting like 12x or 16x eyepieces on. But it doesn't actually make the image clearer. It just makes it bigger. So, um, you know, you could take anything and project it to a larger size. It doesn't necessarily mean that the image quality or what you're seeing is any clearer. Um, in this case, the native uh, quality of our image at uh, currently is a roughly 6,000 times magnification. So about six times what you could get on a normal light microscope. Um, and clearly that's why we can see the detail of the surface structure of this pine pollen um, you can see bits of clay stuck to it um, that you would not normally be able to see in a light microscope. like they are delivering a microscope to my uh, department today. They didn't tell me they were coming and then they just put a giant box um, <laughs> on, um, on the purchasing's uh, dock 
because apparently they can't figure out where I am. I'm not exactly hidden. Uh, I'm on campus and uh, they should have gotten an address where they could have delivered it before they even came here. So they've been trying to call me while I'm streaming, of course, and uh, they call me on my office phone, but I'm not in my office. So that's pretty funny, but um, it appears I'm um, the new microscope that we're getting for our lab will be installed soon. Um, it would have been nice of them to let me know in advance that they were delivering it today rather than just, you know, <laughs> trying to call my office in, in a panic and can't figure out why I'm not in there. Uh, you know, shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody that somebody might not be in their office in our current setting. Okay, so uh, I was just browsing around and I saw another diatom uh, in our field of view and I don't know where it went, so I'm going to just zoom out a little bit and see if I can... Ah, here it is. So I'm actually kind of excited about this diatom. Um, we have seen it before on samples, but I don't know that I got a good external view of it. Um, again, there's a little bit of schmutz on here, but... Um, this is a Pleurocyra, and it's one of my favorite, favorite diatoms to see in the light microscope. And we've seen uh, internal views of it occasionally on the SEM, but rarely um, any sort of clear view of it um, in the external view. And these little um, structures that you see sort of raised up on slight elevations are little tiny pore fields. So it'll be kind of interesting to, um, to zoom in on this guy and get a good look at it. I'm first going to try to get it in focus for us, which is critical. Um, this little opening that we see right here, uh, there we go. Uh, this is a Rimaportula, and um, it's the external component. We saw the internal Rimaportula on um, that Discostella earlier, uh, but this is in fact the external hole for the Rimaportula for this um, Pleurocyra. So Pleurocyra have sort of this uh, egg shape, slightly egg shape uh, to them. They're not round, they're not completely round, and in fact um, normally our round diatoms belong to centrix, but I think, I'm not sure if, I think this is in Bedelphia, so I guess maybe it is a centric, but, um, no, maybe it's not a centric, um, but it's sort of an interesting, weird little, uh, group because most of the Bedelphia are marine organisms and they're very uncommon in, in terms of like a large, uh, a grouping of them in uh, freshwater systems. So um, this one is kind of a small one for a uh, for a Pleurocyra, but um, I guess we won't hold that against it. So I'm just going to take a couple of little artsy shots here. Um, so what's important is you can see there's a bunch of little holes. These are the areoli. They are uh, little portals that go through the, um, the cell wall. And it's a way for the diatom to acquire nutrients or um, exude waste. And, um, and then the rimaportula is sort of a specialized process for uh, diatoms that is different than the rest of these. Um, their purpose is sort of uh, not completely clear, but usually thought to be related to um, allowing diatoms to divide more easily, uh, to, to center their nucleus and things like that. So um, diatoms are single-celled organisms, and this is the skeletal wall of uh, a single cell. 
So now we're just looking at one valve, which is half of the actual diatom. This is the outside view of this pleurocyra. And um, this is a pretty nice image. I'm just gonna go ahead and collect it. I'm a little behind on like posting pictures of things that I've collected. Um, hello, headshot specialist. Um, yeah, they could have just joined my stream, but then they would have been like asking me like, where do I deliver this? Uh, I mean, they should have an address, so. <laughs> Each time you come on the stream, you feel like you're watching a treasure hunt. You never know what's going to appear on the screen. That's actually how I feel about turning on the SEM every time. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you like it. Um, I would say that uh, it's always a mystery to me what we're going to find. We're always uh, a, a bit of a scavenger hunt or a treasure hunt. Um, and... Uh, you know, when, when we started today, so last night they told me they needed these images for the poster for today. And I was like, okay, I'll just like rearrange who, what I was going to do for the stream so that we can take pictures during my stream. That way I don't have to like, um, you know, set aside more time on the SEM than I was already planning. And, um, uh, we put the samples, I, I sent Mallory a message like, can you get the samples ready for me? And so then she scrambled around this morning to find them and get them prepared and uh, get stubs made for me. So I want to say thanks to Mallory for that. Um, Mallory is also an author on the poster. So um, the poster that we're taking these, collecting these images for. Um, so then, you know, like I had no idea whether there would be diatoms in the sample. Um, it's completely possible that we would have, you know, sedimentary samples from a river that don't have any diatoms at all in them. So... Um, it's really nice to be able to uh, find diatoms in the samples. It was what I was, was kind of hoping there would be something in them. Uh, otherwise, Mary's going to have a hard time doing a research project on a sample with no diatoms at all. So, um, so that's uh, a positive. But yeah, it's always like a total mystery what we'll find. And in fact, that's actually kind of similar to my entire uh, research sort of approach, which is that Every time I start on a new project, I don't know what diatoms will be in the samples, and there's a pretty good chance that I've never seen, you know, half or more of those diatoms that we come across at the species level, which means my job's always changing. It's always got some sort of new, interesting element to it where I have to, um, you know, figure out species and in some ways sort of start over. Um, I have a lot of experience identifying diatoms, so it's not completely new to me. But, um, you know, if you've never seen a species before, it's not like you can immediately identify it. So um, it requires a bit of uh, detective work, which is nice. I, I actually really like that aspect of my job. Pleurocyra external rimoporchula hole. And then, um, you know, some, my job never is boring. It never gets old. It's always something new that we could explore and find. And um, I guess I'll do one where it's the whole diatom, and then maybe we can zoom in on one of the elevations. Good news, everyone. <laughs> that volume on the speaker was up super loud for me. <laughs> uh, thank you for the follow. So he startled me with it. Um, let's see, that's 420 Zobs. Thanks. Scared the crap out of me. Um, I turned the volume down so we won't have that uh, particular problem next time. So whoever was listening to stuff in here had the volume cranked way up. Okay, so you should be able to see these little tiny pore fields up here and how distinctly different they are. So usually we refer to these as acelli or pseudo acelli, um, depending on whether or not there's a, a hyaline area around them. I believe these are actually acelli because there's a hyaline area around them. And then you can see the structure that we were looking at in here, which has got the pores and then these little spines or granule structures that are pointed up from the surface. So um, this is a pretty cool uh, picture. I think it's gonna look gorgeous on that poster. Um, and you can see there's the room of Portula hole we were looking at earlier. So um, these are the acelli. They're like little eyes, 
I like to think of this diatom as sort of uh, like an alien head. And as I mentioned, it's kind of egg-shaped. So, um, you know, it's not perfectly round. And then you can see there's a whole bunch of little like ornamented spines around the outside margin as well. Um, out here, they're kind of cone-shaped, right? Like these ones in here, kind of cone-shaped. It's just a little bit of junk on the surface, um, which is tragic, of course, but not that big of a deal. But you can clearly see the pseudoacelli, and um, there's one on this side as well. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about uh, Pleurocyra, uh, it's a river species. It's a species that's pretty common in river systems. So part of the reason I don't get to see it very frequently is that I don't usually look at, at river um, sediments because usually we don't have a way of doing that. So um, one thing that you'll note is these little eye-shaped things. See how it didn't scare me that time? Uh, thank you for the follow, Kuami. Um, these little eye-shaped things that you can see here on the outside edges are the aracelli, are the aceli. They're different shaped, right? Well, this one's a little bit bigger and a little wider. This one's a little bit smaller and a little skinnier. So um, I'm going to go ahead and collect that image. So we are collecting images for a poster for undergraduate research. And so um, part of my objective for today is actually to collect these pictures and then ultimately students will be involved with the uh, research and analysis of um, these sediments to try to reconstruct the history of the river. Have you ever given uh, personal names to diatoms? Well, I mean, I've named diatom species, but um, I don't give them personal names like this one's Bob or Tony or something. Um, normally, there are way too many diatoms to even manage that. Um, I mean, in this sample, I suppose I probably could call the Pleurocyra by a name um, because there's probably not that many of them in the sample. But diatoms are clones, and um, most of the time when you see them, yeah, Bob the diatom, most of the time when you see them, um, you're probably seeing only, um, you know, like if we had hundreds of diatoms in our field of view, um, there might only be like four actual unique organisms there and the rest of them are all just clones of the same four organisms um, i don't know what's common for a lake system in terms of the total number or for a river system with respect to like okay i've got a thousand diatoms how many different actual organisms are there here but it's probably in most cases um you know a dozen or fewer and i don't know how to tell one from the other without some sort of genetic analysis so um you know we're at the point where uh, when we're looking at clones, um, we don't know which ones are which. So uh, it creates an issue for giving things names. I tend to think of them as, uh, you know, uh, all the same organism because probably they are in many cases. Um, we don't have a good boundary for naming clones separately, I guess, uh, for how to do that. So. But you can see these little, it looks like somebody came along with a cake decorator and decorated this thing of the spines. They're like perfectly little, little cone-shaped spines all the way around over here as well. Um, it's pretty neat. And um, yeah, here's the acelli. You can see, I can zoom out a little so you can see all of it at once. Here's one, here's the other. And um, there's a little bit of mucilage that they usually put out on these things. Um, sometimes they live in like colonies and they'll be tied together by these with their neighbor, uh, little mucilage pads. So it's kind of cool. It's a pretty diatom. Um, I'm excited that's going to probably be a nice one for the poster. So this is the Pleurocyra external. And I'm gonna just zoom in now on one of these little acelles so we can get a sense of um, the differences between the main body of the diatom uh, cell wall, uh, which is here on the surface, and then these acelli, which are basically the little tiny pore fields that are here. And as I mentioned, they usually squeeze like a little jelly-like substance out through the holes to tie to a neighboring valve. 
And when I have a whole bunch of little holes like this, I usually like to try to improve my image quality just a little bit by playing with the settings um, to try to get the um, the stigmation as perfect as possible. It's an opportunity. There's always an opportunity to improve my focus quality just a little bit. Um, but this is one of those. So um, I think that looks good. Everything is pretty sharp. And I think we can see pretty clearly that boundary between um, the normal part of the cell wall and the little specialized component called a celly. So celly just mean eyes. Um, but in our case, they, they are represented by these little tiny pores that we see uh, in a little field, a pore field, basically. Get us a nice image of that as well. You can see how clean um, and clear those images are even at this magnification. So currently we're at around 21,000 times magnification, so about three times higher than we were when we were looking at that other thing, the other aspect of it when I was talking about sort of um, 7,000 times magnification. So, hey Devil and Mrs. J, how are you doing? We have, uh, we're in a, uh, a situation where it's just me here today and um, so I'm doing your shout outs for you. Uh, you should give Devil and Mrs. J a little follow if you're interested. She's doing, uh, usually doing crafting on uh, Twitch. So, and um, Pacific Plankton, who's normally here, is currently in a class uh, helping students look at stuff. So my normal weekly moderator uh, in the channel is missing. Um, so I'm on my own. It's okay, chat's been pretty quiet. Um, so I haven't had to struggle with it too much. And um, uh, that's fine. It's nice and cool, calm, nice quiet stream from the SEM. Um, that uh, constant buzzing noise you hear in the background is actually the pump for the SEM, which has to run in order for us to collect images and uh, operate the instrument. So um, it's just part of our full uh, ASMR service here with the visual ASMR with the SEM and then uh, my gravelly voice that I use when I'm talking into a microphone that's close to me and uh, the pump in the background. So. It's a pretty diatom. This is a nice image. Um, I don't know that this will go on the poster, but it will look nice if I colorize it and stick it into the uh, Instagram for the um, for the lab. If you're not familiar with the Instagram for my lab page, it's here. Um, you can check out a lot of the other images. Some of the images that you see in the colored sort of slideshow below us um, in this box down here. Uh, will also appear on the SEM uh, Instagram page. So if you want to saw one and you thought it could look kind of cool, you want to go um, check it out, uh, you could always go there and uh, browse around. That's good. This is a Aselli. Sell us. There's just one. Um, and then I'm going to zoom out. We'll go try to find something else. So we'll leave behind our Pleurocyra friend here and uh, see what else we can find in our material. So if you're wondering what's it sitting on, what's all this crap, uh, this is actually plant material. So uh, the cells for the actual plant you can see right here that each one of these little rectangles is basically a plant cell so to give you some sense of how big diatoms are um, you know this diatom that we were looking at 
don't remember what the actual like size of the diatom was. It's probably like 50 microns or something like that, 40 to 50 microns across. Um, so just to give you some sense, like here's a little plant cell basically, right? Um, there are some pieces of diatoms in here as well. So um, probably the most common diatom that we find in the Wabash River is Cyclotella meniginina, and it's not very attractive, it's tiny, and um, I'm sure we'll find some if I browse around a little bit. Um, it's a little tiny circular diatom in valve view, uh, or drum shaped if you want. It, think about it in three dimensions. And we see a lot of it. Um, probably that little discus stella that we saw in here will be pretty common. Here's another little round guy. Yeah, that's like Latella meninginina right there. I think. Oh, no, that's a discus stella, actually. That same discus stella from before. Pretty sure. Oh no, Cyclotella meninginina, I think. It's just got a lot of crap on it. Covered with some clay. There's another particle up here. Oh, I don't know what that is. Not a diatom. It's an internal view of a diatom. That's also Cyclotella meninginina. And this one is the Discostella. Yep. So again, it just has those four, same four that we saw, plus a, a Rimaporchula. It's a, basically the same view that we saw of that one before. And if I zoom out, you can kind of get a sense of them. They're all small. These are five microns or less. This one's also in the sort of seven, five to seven range right now. Um, but you can see there's some sort of different structures to the two different diatoms. So they don't look exactly the same. If they did, they'd be the same species. So I don't know that I've seen any um, Astera costata in the samples yet. Uh, and it's possible that we won't find it um, in this little bit of material that goes onto the SEM. Um, it would be nice if we did. Uh, but I have images of Astera costata from other work, so we can always use those if we wanted to. That is also meninginina and a little one. I'm moving around in a sort of semi-chaotic fashion, just wherever I see diatoms, I kind of click in that direction. Um, so hopefully we'll come across something interesting. And then um, probably in an hour or close to it, I'll be ending the stream. Um, I'm going to try to stay pretty close to my schedule for today. Um, instead of my normal sort of bumbling around for an extra hour looking at diatoms because I'm fascinated by something I found on the SEM. And um, the reason for that is I have a appointment with students where I'm going to talk to them a little bit about my career and research. So we've um, got a environmental science club which um, meets here once a week and um, at least nominally, I am their advisor. So um, they mostly run on their own. They don't need a lot of advising, but um, they're asking a bunch of the faculty to come into a Zoom meeting today to talk about the, um, their experiences, how they got where they were or that, how they got where they are and, um, and their concept for research or whatever. So, um, and of course asked me if I would participate and also my wife Carlin, so that both of us are gonna be um, talking to students about our research. Uh, I think they got most of the faculty in our department to, um, to engage, which is nice, so. That I think is Cyclotella meninginina again. 
Yeah. So it'd probably be good to have at least one picture of it. And this one's pretty clean. Um, you can see in the other one we had uh, Mantle Photo Portula, just like this one has, but um, they were between the costi. So they were occurring basically here rather than on the costi. And then um, this also has a room of portula you can see right there, a big one sticking out into the sample. And then it has a uh, Valface photo portula, which is this sort of um, diamond shaped one here in the middle. It's actually got four satellite pores. The ones on the sides have either three or two typically, um, but you can see that one very clearly or you should be able to now. And I'm just gonna, again, play with it a little bit to see if I could improve that image quality. When you get to the really small stuff like this, um, that's when things like wobble and stigmation start to really matter. Um, when it's in this sort of very small size range. So um, we're at around 30,000 times can zoom in a little bit, um, or like 36,000 times. It doesn't take a lot of zooming in when you're already super close to raise the magnification a lot. So just a tiny twist of that wheel um, where I used to, to magnify it basically moved us up 6,000 times. Um, so once you start getting kind of close, that's the way it is. Um, but you can see all of the detail in here of the stri, these little light little holes, and then these little things are called uh, alveolar chambers. And it looks like there's a piece of junk over here that's causing me to get lines on my image, which I don't like. So I'm gonna try to zoom out just a bit and see if I can get rid of the lines. They're still there, they're just not as obvious. Oh, nope, it's still there. So I think I'm gonna have to abandon taking this picture because I'm not gonna be happy with lines going across it. Uh, and that's just because there's some high topography over here and it's causing interference with the actual diatom um, as it scans across, so. I think we'll have other candidates that we can take pictures of for Cyclotella meningenia anyway. Maybe they won't be as clean or as obvious as that one, but um, they also won't have lines in them, so. Maybe this is one we could use. Oh, that one's got junk on it. There's two of them. Always a constant struggle in the SEM, fighting with clay and silt-sized particles um, that get stuck on the diatoms. Um, you know, like I said, you just kind of get used to it. But um, if I'm taking pictures for a poster, I don't want to have giant lines going across it. That's Meningeniana again from the outside. It's just got two giant boulders sitting on top of it. <laughs> Silt-sized boulders. So it would have been good if I could get the silt off of it. Probably, oh, it's another Pleurocyra it looks like. This one's a little broken, so not quite as nice as the one that we saw before. It doesn't have any junk on it, uh, or not much. Again, there's the hole for the rim of portula. Here's the acelli. All the features are here. It's just cracked. You can see there's a big giant fracture in it. Um, yeah, it's about 50 to 60 microns across. They can get even bigger than that. Um, I think they can get up into the hundreds of microns. Um, on occasion. The babies, the littlest ones, are old, and the biggest ones are babies. Diatoms are sort of backwards in that sense. 
everything goes from um, from big size to small size as they clone themselves they make themselves a little bit smaller each time so it often leads them to be progressively smaller until they get to a certain size threshold and then um, they'll switch to sexual reproduction typically again there's another mangonine it's just covered with clay so thwarted once again by clay um, for these samples we tried to reduce the clay by rinsing them so we shake up the sample and um, allow it to settle a little bit and then vacuum off the water while the clay is still suspended so we're using uh, Stokes law in our favor that little particles like clay and tiny bits of the silt will still be in suspension because they will settle through the water column a little bit more slowly because their surface area to volume is um, higher so they have more friction as they move through the water and they settle more slowly as a result and they'll stay suspended um, so when we vacuum off the water basically it gets rid of uh, preferentially gets rid of those that are really tiny and hopefully we don't vacuum off any tiny diatoms but if we do it's probably okay uh, to get rid of some diatoms in order to salvage the fact that we would be able to see everything else so There's another nice Cyclotella minigenina, again attached with the little boulder here, and the valve face photoportula is missing from it. Um, maybe it's here, it's just dissolved. This one's relatively clear otherwise. Oh, it looks like maybe it tried to make one of its photoportula here on this costi and messed it up. That's pretty funny. A bit of a uh, mutant diatom. So normally these would all be around this edge. Some of them apparently slid down when it was making and slightly deformed. There's a big one. Again, Meningeniina, the same thing. It looks like a paper plate, basically. And you can see this one has a, a valve face photoportula and a rimoportula is visible, although there's a little bit of clay over here on the bottom side. So again, I'm gonna be picky. I'll just keep browsing around until we find some higher quality specimens to take pictures for. One of the problems with trying to get good images on an SEM is trying to figure out at what height should I be looking for them um, in terms of the elevation away from the sample. It's sometimes difficult for me to get a sense of, am I too far out? Am I missing things because I'm too far out? Because um, we want to sort of like move through a lot of material to find them. But if we're too far out, uh, they'll be too small for us to see so I kind of have to zoom in and out. And if I'm too close, it means I've got to do a lot of clicking to move up and down in the sample to get to a place where I can resolve 
our diatoms. Uh, this is an interesting diatom. It's got, again, a boulder on the surface. But I think we could still use this as an image. Can I just get it into focus for us? Oh, it's got a lot of clay. I think it's Melosyra. In our samples, it's probably Melosyra variens, which is the only one that I think I've seen in Indiana. It's just under one of these silt boulders. In the light microscope, uh, Melocerevarians is super boring. It just looks like a pill capsule, basically. In the scanning electron microscope, it actually is pretty dynamic looking. Um, this is sort of like popcorn structure on a valve face. Um, and then all these little openings or holes that you can see. Um, it's a lot of clay on the outside margin, but I still sort of like this image, um, despite the fact that we have a giant boulder on it. Hey, Del. And Jurgling, hello. Sorry, I missed a bunch. I was busy scanning through samples. Bluesy, hello. Um, <laughs> uh, it's nice to see everybody here. Uh, joking man, what are we looking at? We're looking at diatoms. These are diatoms from the Wabash River. And um, earlier I mentioned that these were collected from the sediment core and that normally you can't core um, river systems, but in this case, a train has fallen into the river maybe 80 years ago or something. And um, the car, one of the train cars basically was left in the bottom of the river. And so on the, the lee side, the down water side of it, um, sediments can accumulate and they can't be really eroded very easily because of the train car blocking the water. So now the train's completely buried um, under sediment and uh, we collected a core from the back side of it, which is um, kind of interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> rescue microscope in process. Um, so it was, a, it was a while ago uh, when the train car fell in the water. Uh, I think there was a bridge there. Either, either the bridge collapsed or, um, or the train just fell in. I don't know. A part of the car fell in. I wasn't around at the time, um, so I don't know exactly what the, the history is. Uh, but if you go to the river today and uh, scout around on the bottom, you can actually see... Uh, you can actually see uh, like a sort of an outline for the train car. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, uh, these are diatoms from a core that students collected and then I'm collecting images so that we can put the images on a poster about the student research um, that's going to happen on the core. So we're looking at it geochemically. We're trying to look and see, try to get the history of river pollution. Um, it's located just north of Terre Haute where I live. Um, and so uh, it actually was nice because it'll give us some like local history of the river, which we don't really have for, um, you know, like water quality over that time span. And um, the Wabash River has a history of a lot of pollution. So it will be interesting to see if from the record that we get, if we can see any of that um, recovery um, associated with cleaner water today than say 80 years ago when the train was dumped in the, <laughs> in the river. So um, we'll see. Uh, 
Uh, it's nice to see you, Dell. I'm glad you could make it for the stream, even if you have phone calls for work all the time. Stupid work, always getting in the way of our fun. Um, I'm pretty happy that we actually have diatoms in these samples. I was not sure that was going to be the case when I started. So, um, that's a Stephanodiscus. See, it's missing costi. It doesn't have costi at all. Uh, or it has inner fascicles, which are basically these little spaces between striae. And then it does have mantophotoportula around the edge. And I'm not seeing any valve face photoportula yet. Uh, maybe this is one. It's kind of dissolved um, and covered with clay, but I think that's actually one valve face photoportula. So with that bit of information, I probably could figure out what this is to species if I was aiming to do that. Um, it's, uh, I guess it's not my job at the moment. A student is gonna do that, um, but it's good to know what the characteristics are in case we come across it and then they're trying to figure out what the species is, I can help them. Uh, but it has one valve face photoportula is highly useful bits of information. You can't see from the light microscope how many photoportula a diatom have, or typically you can't. So it's um, highly valuable. A bit of information that we can only get from an SEM. Um, it's not to say that you can't identify a diatoms to species without an SEM. I did it for many years before getting one. But um, in some cases, it's hard to tell what the species is. And so you end up putting it in like a uh, CF, like it looks kind of like this, compare it against something like this, uh, sort of a box. And that's fine if you're just trying to um, get a general handle on what you're looking at. But um, ooh, what's that? But probably not great for um, trying to in infer actual information about um, a diatom. Ooh, totally not sure what this thing is. Uh, it's shaped like a pleurocyra, but it doesn't have the pleurocyra valve ends on it. I guess it could be a uh, cockanese. Yeah, I think it's a cockanese. It's the aphid valve of a cockanese. Sort of elliptical shape. It has a sternum, but it doesn't have a raphe run running through it. And um, the surface is kind of covered with junk, so I can't really see exactly what's going on there. But And do a bit of just uh, basic, well, it has these things, so it should be this. So it's not a whole lot of elliptical shaped diatoms. Um, her egg shaped diatoms are pretty uncommon, so. This is the same diatom we just imaged, Melosyra, only this is in girdle view. So as I was saying, they look kind of boring in the light microscope. They just look like little pill shapes and uh, squared off pilled shapes. And that's what we're seeing is basically the girdle view or the side view of that round diatom we saw under the boulder a second ago. So this is the valve face that we would have been seeing in the other view. And now we're seeing it basically um, from the side. So you can see both valves, and one of them's been broken open, so you can see inside of the valve, which is kind of nice. And um, here you can actually see the structure on the valve edge right here a little bit of that diatom. Also, it's a good confirmation for me that we were actually looking at Melosyra. So, um, Seems how I don't see a lot of these things in the SEM. It's kind of nice to, it's like, uh, I guess this is Melosyra, but it's clearly, this is the same thing. Okay. Don't think I'm gonna image that though. Kind of boring diatom. We already spent some time on it. So all of the 
um, images that we've been collecting so far have just been from one sample, um, which was collected from the sediment core. Um, I have like seven of them in here uh, in the actual SEM in the carousel that you can see below. So we could always switch to another one, but I feel like there's a lot of debris on all the slides, so or all the stubs. So, um, you know, this one has actually a fair number of diatoms on it. So let me just stick out, stick with it for a little while. This is the whole diatom. This is its inside, and that's the other valve. And it looks like it's just sort of popped open when it landed. So you can see uh, the insides of the insides of both valves, and then they're kind of tied together by a little bit here that's linking them. Um, this is Discostella again. I don't know exactly what species. Little Discostella are sometimes a challenge in the light microscope. I just kind of like telling one from another because the details are so tiny. But in the SCM, you can see this one has the same sort of pitted surface that we saw in the previous one. There's like these little pits here. It has all the same features. It's got, um, you know, five maybe, uh, Mantophotoporchula on each one of the valves. And then there's the uh, Rima portula for this valve. I think the other one's probably hidden in this one. We can't quite see it, but um, this is a nice clean shot of that um, mantle photoportula. You can see it's got two uh, satellite pores. All these ones look like they have two. Sometimes you can't tell very clearly how many satellite pores are present because they're sitting up under a lip. And so it's kind of hard to get access to them to see them cleanly. So this is a nice shot. So I'm just going to go ahead and take that. I'm going to see what sort of comedy antics are going on in the channel as a result. Okay. Pollution-wise, our local river once was really bad. Yeah. And that's basically what we think, is that the water quality here was really bad. And, um, and it's improved. And one way that we could tell is by actually... Um, <laughs> actually uh, looking at the diatoms and the geochemistry. So, Since this came from a river, I wonder if you would be able to find these in local muscle chalk stone cliffs. Do we have local muscle chalk stone cliffs here? Um, I don't know that we have those. Being a Tiatom seems pretty chill and an easy kind of life. Yeah, I would say pragmatic, that's probably true. Diatoms are pretty laid back in general. Uh, they do a lot of floating, sucking up nutrients and um, hanging out in the sunlight where they can get food. Uh, and then they do a lot of replicating, so a lot of cloning themselves and then floating for these guys. But the other ones kind of crawl around or attach themselves to a substrate. It's pretty chill. I would say they're just kind of sitting there. Oh, Southwest Germany. Okay. Uh, let's see. We've got big cliffs made of former sea creatures. So you might be able to... Um, hang on, i got somebody at the door. You might be able to find them inside of the actual shell. Occasionally answer the door by myself. Um, yeah, so. Hey, Pacific Plankton. Welcome back. How's your class running? Was it fun? Did you see anything good in your plankton samples? That's good. We're looking at a tiny disc of Stella that's cracked open. We can see inside of both valves. You saw diatoms? Well, that doesn't surprise me. pretty common occurrence in your samples, I think. Uh, this is a nice view of the inside of um, 
a discostella, a little tiny discostella. It's not a stereocostata, but um, it's cracked open in a really interesting way. So, discostella, internal, both valves. Get a sense of um, uh, what the inside of the diatom looks like, but we can't see the outside, right? <laughs> so we have both internal views, no external view. Uh, some uh, aerodynamic process, which probably means that often we see internal rather than external views, because as they fall through the water column, they usually flip over. So, um, you know, oftentimes we'll get more internal views than external views of any diatoms because um, they're cup shaped hey we finally got a decent view of the inside of a cyclotella meningenina here and i'm just zooming in on the mantle sorry the valve face photoportula so you can see them here i think they have four satellite pores in this image going to zoom out and hopefully we won't get any sort of weird distortions. This one is uh, broken along the outside edge over here. You can see that like a piece of it, chunk of it's broken off, but you can see very clearly it's slightly tilted so you can see all of the um, mantle photoportula on this edge. And also if we look on the other side, because of the way it's tilted a little bit, because it's sitting up on this uh, silt grain, is... Um, spines, which is common for cyclotella, but none of the other organisms that we uh, see that are usually, except for stephanodiscus, um, a typical like Lindavia or discostella don't actually have spines. So kind of nice to be able to see those as well. And this will probably be okay for the poster as well. It looks like the quality is pretty good and see any like weird lines from the silk grains coming through the sample. So just hopefully it stays that way. That's symmetry. Yeah, diatoms are symmetrical. That's part of their, their style. Uh, pretty spectacular. Is there information we can glean from counting the number of spines? Probably not, um, unless you're looking for taxonomic information. Um, for some diatoms, like Stephanodiscus, for example, the ratio of spines to intercosti will allow us to figure out like what species we're looking at. Um, in another paper that we published, so I've been super productive in terms of papers being released in the past two weeks. Um, I had a paper come out last week from um, that a student, a former student of mine and who I'm currently advising through their PhD program um, where we modeled, 3D modeled diatoms and we used it to estimate how much silica is being um, deposited in the valve and in that paper we talk about um, one of the things that's kind of interesting which is spines are basically places where diatoms stuff a bunch of silica so um, the um, but it also means that they um, need more silica if they produce spines. It's just like an ornamentation on the outside of the valve. And so um, it, it requires a bunch of silica, though, to make the spines. And if you took them out, it would reduce the amount of um, silica required by the diatom by quite a bit um, relative to its actual proportion. It might be something like 15% maybe of the total mass of silica on a valve. So um, I'm just thinking about like uh, how much extra silica that is for something that we don't even know what the spines do for the most part. Um, I mean, in theory, there's supposed to be something that would protect the diatom, but um, I'm pretty, uh, pretty questionable to me how this little spine makes it significantly bigger um, especially when there's a whole bunch of uh, the same species that are much smaller than this and still have the spines. So, I mean, 
how does that help? It's not clear. So it's a regular question that I have, uh, which is like, why do diatoms need spines at all? Um, in some cases, it's clearer when they have really long spines or they use them to connect to their neighbors. But these ones don't do that, and they're not that big. Um, so it's like a complete mystery to me. Like, what are they doing wasting a bunch of silica um, when it's a precious resource for them um, on spines? So, Cyclotella meneginina internal. I keep an eye on the clock today. I actually have something going on at 3.15 or something. So that'll be good. That actually is something that's a common diatom, and that's a real nice view of it. So I'm happy about that. And pretty happy with the pleurosyra that we saw earlier as well. Um, a couple of them. Internal views, but... Um, or no, I saw an external view. Yeah. So, I think two external views. This is a uh, Nitsia. You can see there's, uh, let's see, it's just a fragment of one. Um, on the outside edge here is where the raphe is. And these things are called fibula, these little windows um, with a strut process that they, or strut structure that comes onto the valve face made out of silica that, that uh, defines them. So characteristic of the nitsioid diatoms um, is that sort of structure of the fibula. Also in the sororella that we saw earlier, they also have fibulae. It's another nitsia, two of them. There's a lot of mud on it though. This is, um, well, there's something here. And I'll come back to that one as well. Uh, not sure what the species is for this one. Maybe Silophora. Oh, that's kind of an interesting looking diatom. It's got these really distinct holes next to the actual raphe. Uh, Cosmonese, maybe? I don't know. I should probably get a picture of this one. I'm going to rotate it a little. Rotated it right out of the field of view. Both uh, raphe ends deflect in the same direction. There is a central area that looks like it's high line and sort of bow tie shaped, which is why I thought it might be um, Silophora. And also the raphe looks kind of Silophoroid. So I feel like it could be Silophora. But these really weird large pores next to the um, raphe are kind of throwing me off a little. Normally, for Slaughter, it has a thickened raphe uh, ledge on the outside of the valve, and then hyaline areas on the ends, which I think these actually have. So I feel like it's probably Slaughter. But um, Anna usually makes fun of me when I say Slaughter because uh, it's a good place to dump a lot of things when I don't know what it is. I usually go, uh, I don't know, Slaughter, because um, it has a lot of limited characteristics that show up regularly so uh, actually I'm pretty sure this is sloffer if that is part of the valve back here it's got a little silica platform so I'm gonna try to incorporate that in my image because that looks like it's part of this diatom which means that is sloffera for sure take that on a I got it right What did I miss? Diatom beards. Something good happened. Uh, 
you're taking the family to bodega tomorrow. Is it S T H like an insect's hair? Like it is S T H sensory. I don't know what S T H means. <laughs> yeah, it's a slaffer. Um yeah. I it's a good default. Uh, I read that there's diatom species that has chromosomes number of hundred up number up to hundred and thirty. That's nuts. Oh something. Or sometimes. Oh okay. Something like an insect hair. No. Um I don't think there's some sort of sensory organs on diatoms like that. Um, thanks for the, the help there, not and gate. Um, I don't think it's a sensory organ at all. Um, I mean, they don't have organs. They have organelles, um, but they're single-celled organisms, so they don't have complex, like, sensory components like most other multicellular organisms do. And... Um, they can sort of sense light and uh, some chemicals, um, nutrients, for sure, like silica, but um, not in the sense of like, I mean, more like we have a sense of balance. It's, it's not like they actually have a, um, organs. What do you do when you don't have us and are waiting for these pictures to scan? Check my email, usually. It's a good question. Um, sometimes I just watch the pictures. Uh, I definitely don't chat to myself, if that's what you're wondering. Um, also, when I'm not streaming and I'm on the SEM, I usually have my headphones and I'm listening to music. Um, I could still do that. Uh, I could still put music in through headphones right now if I wanted. Um, I've just been, you know, doing it without the cans, I guess. Uh, it's been so long since I've actually used the SEM where I wasn't streaming or didn't have a student in the lab with me. Um, but that question is almost moot. External. Um, it's pretty much all of my SEM time gets streamed recently or or I'm working directly with a student trying to train them. So uh, that's been going on for since August, basically, because uh, I just don't have a lot of other spare time. There's another Nitsia over here. We can zoom over and look at it. It looks like it's a fragment. Yeah, it's broken, but that's a Nitsia as well. Oh no, it's not a Nitsia, it's a Fragilaria. You can see, uh, Ulnaria. Yeah, a broken ulnaria. I don't know what species. And then we had something over here that I wanted to look at, which is where I'm going. Um, like with the light microscope in the SEM, we just sort of learned to memorize landscapes and shift around uh, to, <laughs> I remember there was a thing, it was this direction, um, and only matters if I tilt the, uh, turn, rotate the stage, then it becomes problematic. So this is, uh, an interesting diatom. Again, this is a common riverine species, or species that's usually found, um, in flowing water or wave energy water, um, what we would call rheophilic species or species that like flowing water. And this is the genus Raymeria, um, named after the fabulous diatomist Charles Reimer, who um, I met when I was learning diatoms in the diatom science training camp, or whatever you want to call it, uh, in Okoboji uh, in 2000. 
and he subsequently has passed away, but um, revered by the entire diatom community as a very well-respected and well-known taxonomist in his time. And this genus was named after him. Um, and that is really kind of cool looking uh, pore covers. They look like pacifier shaped or something in there. They're really interesting. Let's see what we can do about making those look good. You can see there's a little bit of an offset in the image, and that's been happening the whole time. I think it's because the heating element's not perfectly set up correctly on the SEM, so like it's migrating just a little couple of microns, maybe half of a micron or something, uh, each time it goes around. So there's a slight distortion. So Rhymeria, I don't know if Peck sent the uh, genus command for that one, but they're asymmetric. Um, they're like a loaf of bread or something shaped. And then um, they, I think they belong with the Gomphonema diatoms, which is sort of interesting um, conceptually, but they're common in river systems and like flowing water. This is probably Rhymeria sinuata, um, but I need to look closely at the stri to tell that. So up here you can see there's sort of a weird structure, like it's like gills or something. It's actually the apical pore field. And then this is the um, helictoglossa, which is the internal expression of the raphe end. There's another one down here, the end of the raphe. And there's some clay over top of um, the actual raphe itself, which is this line that runs through the middle of the sternum, and it's eccentric, which means that the raphe is on one, closer to one side of the valve margin than the other, and because it's a little bit more dome-shaped on this side and a little flatter on the belly side, this is the dorsal and this is the ventral, and the raphe is slightly eccentric towards the ventral side in this case, and then um, all of those characteristics basically put us into Rhymeria. So, and then the species are usually determined by the shape, the outline, and how many um, of these little holes are in each one of these uh, striae or um, little chamber-like structures you can see here. So. Yeah, you got it? It's a pretty diatom. Let's see. Uh, you train the students you don't like. Do I train students I don't like? I like my students. Uh, why would I train people I don't like? Do I know any good diatom jokes? Mm, not really. I mean, I'm sure there are some. They're probably only funny if you're a diatomist, though, you know? Uh, do diatoms stick to things or do they float wherever the current takes them? A little bit of both. So some diatoms are floaters or plankton. Some diatoms like to stick to things. Um, and it depends on what genus they are. Uh, so at some level, uh, they're either one or the other. Usually you don't have both as an option, although there are some diatoms that kind of do both. Um, yeah, some travel around, some grow stalks, some live in colonies, some stick to things. Um, yeah. Uh, hey, Tropical Geek, how's it going? Where are the girls? Um, I hope you mean like the young ladies that work in my lab. So I think they're all in class today. Um, I was actually expecting to have some guests and do a different stream today, um, but it didn't work out. So I told everybody they didn't need to be here. And then of course they weren't here. So, but I think Mallory's in the lab uh, in a class. Eleanor's probably in the lab in a class studying or in a class. And uh, uh, Sukanya 
is probably on the microscope. Addie's probably counting or on the microscope. You know, they're all, they're all working. They're busy. So, um, I haven't seen Rihanna for like a month. She's just disappeared. So, uh, hopefully she's okay. I'm guessing it's just like, um, busy with school probably so and uh laura has labs on wednesday i think so she's probably getting ready for the lab i've got a lot of students uh, that work in my lab that are, they are all young ladies um but uh i also have a young man who works in my lab but he doesn't do diatom stuff so he doesn't need to do any SEM work he's a GIS specialist he's getting his PhD and he's almost done so he will be graduating I think this summer Rimeria internal and then uh, next year Mary will become a grad student in my lab, so I'll have another grad student, but she's been in the lab all along, so she's not going anywhere. And uh, I think Samantha will be joining my lab group as well. And Hannah, so all girls. <laughs> um, not my fault. All I can say about that is uh, we have a lot of young ladies in our program. It's a and I've got a long history of supporting women in science. So um, just take it as a positive. I think I saw a diatom right here. Oh, it's got a huge chunk broken in the middle connecting the two rafi branches. That is a navicula. You can tell because this, um, the areoli are slit shaped or what we call lineolate. And then, yeah, it's got a big chunk broken here. This is the raphe, and there's a, um, a fracture on the valve face that's basically connecting the two branches of the raphe that normally would only be internally connected by a little tube. So it's undergone some sort of stress and broken. Probably while it was being transported Downstream, I mean, to the site. That is a big chunk of something. Piece of plant. Uh, just as a caveat, when I say big, it's big relative to the diatoms we're looking at. <laughs> Nothing that we're looking at is big on the SEM. It's all little. It's just a matter of how little. Well, um, I got 20 minutes, so we're just going to browse around a little bit longer, see what else we can find. Maybe there'll be something new. Uh, in there and um, for us to look at um, but if not I feel like we've done a good job today catching at least some of the um, it's another pleurocyra a broken one but you can see the ocelli the little tiny holes on the valve face here, separated by a hyaline band from the actual pores. So these are areoli. These are what are called pori, little tiny holes, and a whole bunch of them together creates a pore field. And when the pore field is circular, we call it an acellus, especially if it's surrounded by a hyaline uh, piece of silica. So this is the diatom pleurocyra that we were looking at earlier. Again, um, it's just a fragment of it, and that's the external view. So it's a really pretty diatom. Um, one of my absolute favorites, like favorite, favorite diatoms. 
Um, and if you ask me why, I, I don't know. It just looks kind of cool, and it's easy to identify. Um, sometimes uh, I like diatoms because they're just easy. Some of them are just easy to identify. It's very distinct. Um, so uh, when your job is to identify diatoms, then you can do it every time you see that diatom. That is Pleurocyra lavis. I don't need to, to um, struggle. I know exactly what it is. I know it to species. And, um, and I always know it when I see it. So that makes it easy. This diatom, on the other hand, is a Sororella. We saw a Sororella before. This is just another Sororella, a different species. This one's always been in Sororella. The one that we saw before used to be a Somatopleura and then moved in, was in Sororella and then moved to Somatopleura and then back to Sororella. Uh, this one's always been in Sororella, as far as I know. I don't actually know the, uh, the species for this one off the top of my head. Um, but I know that uh, nobody would have called that anything other than a Sororella, so where it belongs, where it stayed. A little bit of clay on the surface, but I still think we could get a picture of it for the poster. So we're going to have a bunch of nice images to give to the students to put on their um, National Council for Undergrad Research poster, and then uh, at least some part of the core will have some interesting diatoms in it for um, Mary to count this summer when she analyzes the diatoms from this record. So it's a good one. I'll just go ahead and take that picture and then I can come back and see what's going on in chat. Probably have enough time for maybe one more picture. Um, let's see. Lab assistants are soaking up knowledge. Yeah, probably. Um, my colored pictures are amazing. Well, thank you. Uh, behold the microcosm. Yes, we are in the microcosm. Hello, Zetimis. Zetimis. It's nice to see you. Um, we are looking at some diatoms from the Wabash River, so. And I'm collecting images for a student um, poster that my lab technician, Mallory, is on and another student in my lab, Mary, are both on the poster. So um, they left a little space on the poster or they're planning to so that I can give them diatom images. And um, that's what I'm doing, collecting them. So they've got to actually submit the finished poster today. So we're right up against the deadline, but I told them I could get them to them before three or by three, then um, they can just integrate them onto the poster. So that's nice. So, and it shouldn't take me long. <laughs> well, normally I would have the students here helping me with the actual process, but um, the student who normally would be analyzing these, Mary, is in class right now. So she's taking Petrology. I think she's in her petrology class right now. So um, because the poster's due today and the images are due today as a result, um, and I was streaming anyhow, um, I'm here collecting images. So um, it's my SEM lab, so it's nice. I can come in and do some SEM work and I can stream it. Um, we stream onto, from the SEM onto Twitch um, every Wednesday afternoon and Friday, or sorry, Saturday afternoon. And um, so I was going to be on the SEM anyway. Um, so it's nice to be able to actually provide some, uh, some images that will be used in posters. And then I'll probably use them for the Instagram page as well. So uh, but I have positive interactions with all of my students in general. And um, I'm happy. I'm also an author on the poster, so I guess I'm not it's not exclusively for them. I'm also going to be an author on the poster, but uh, I don't really need poster abstract presentation credits for my CV or anything at this point. Um, it's, it's okay without them. 
So this is Sorella. And yeah, I probably got time for maybe one or two more pictures. So let's see what we can do about finding something else to look, um, look at and collect the images for. And thank you for the follow. Um, you'll have to ask my students if they feel like they're lucky to have me. I guess it's a question mark, but I think generally they like um, working in my lab and being able to use the SEM. And here's some more of those. This is the other Sorella. I know where we are in the slide because that's where we were looking at the Pleurocyra before. So I'm going to... We drifted because I keep turning the stage. Kind of curious what this mass is here. I'm still not sure what that is. <laughs> I don't know what that structure is. Not a diatom. I don't think that's a diatom at all. It's too big and uh, also not the right shapes. Um, let's see. What's this? Cyclotella? Just a fragment of one. Why don't we jump over to sample seven, which is a little deeper in the core and see if we can find anything else. Uh, that's plant material. This is Pleurocyra again, but this is the internal view. And it's got little tiny silt sized boulders, but you can see these are the acelli uh, here and here. So we have those same two components. And then I think the room of Portula should be like right here under one of these boulders, so we won't be able to see it. But I think I can still image this, and you know, it's got some dirt on it. Uh, but we'll just tolerate the silt boulders as a necessary evil. And get a nice internal view, otherwise, of this guy. Makes it really feel like it's a river uh, sample when it's got a bunch of dirt on it because mostly what the rivers are carrying are silt-sized grains. So, and as it crosses over, you can see it's scanning here. It's building the image as we go. Um, you can see into the actual acelli, there are, you know, elevations or depressions, depending on which way you're holding the, the valve. And then you can see those little tiny holes are actually visible inside. If you're very careful, look in there. So it's nice and highly focused, which is the way I like it. Okay, let's see. Um, I'll zoom up and see what I missed. Uh, can these things travel upstream? No, they travel downstream. Um, Grizzwashu, they are being carried downstream as the current flows. And probably something like this is normally attached to the bottom. So probably this diatom, which is Pleurocyra, um, would normally be living attached. And the reason that we're seeing it in the water is um, the, the flow of the water causes it to get detached and it carries it downstream. So, um, and then it ends up being deposited, in this case, behind a train, a uh, train car that had fallen in the river and created a bit of a baffle for the current so um, as a result, sediment could accumulate behind the train car 
um, that's stuck down there. And, um, and the diatoms are basically just piling up there, right? So the backside. Uh, diatoms can't swim though, and they could never go upstream. There are some that are plankton in the sample that we're looking at, and they're just gonna be carried downstream with whatever, with the water. So they would never go the other way. Uh, hello, mind of a snail, how are you doing? Uh, birds could transport them upstream, so that is an option. It's something that we could see happening. They can't swim though. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the internal view of a pleurocyra and uh, it's just got some dirt, some silt sized dirt and a little bit of clay sized particles um, in, in the um, internal view that we're looking at. We saw this one from the outside as well. Um, and then if you look in here really carefully, you should be able to see those little tiny holes. And I can probably zoom in on them. So you can see those little tiny holes in that poor field for the acellus. So. Nice highly resolved image, even though it's got some junk on it, so. Otherwise it would have been perfect, although this diatom's also broken a little bit right here. You see like a piece of its chunk of it's been broken off. But otherwise it would have been a really great specimen to image. It didn't have these boulders on it. Okay, I've got five minutes left. It's enough time for one more image. Um, and then I'm probably gonna have to go because I have, a, I have to give a I have to meet with some students to talk about career decisions. So, Syrah internal. Um, they wanted to meet with professors and sort of discuss how we got to where we are and um, talk to us a little bit about the research that we do. Um, and I'm always on board for that sort of a conversation with students. I try to help them figure out what do they want to do? What do they want to be when they grow up? You know, so when their parents ask them, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, they can go, oh, I want to be a diatomist. And they'll be like, what's that? You know, probably most of them don't want to grow up to be a diatomist though, so it's fine. Some of them will, me. I think it's useful for them to hear that um, at some time in the past I was a student and uh, I didn't pop into being a full professor overnight. Um, so it's useful for them to understand that there's sort of a pathway that leads to where they are and to the careers that they select. So they don't need to know today what they're gonna be uh, 10 years from now. In fact, they probably will get it wrong um, no matter what you do uh, in science. You start off on a path and you end up someplace else. So the trick is to just roll with it and, uh, and know that you make a selection that you keep following the selections that are things that you like to do. So you end up in a place where if you want to be a diatomist and you enjoy it, you should be. It's much easier to be successful at something if you really enjoy the work you do. So. seeing a ton of diatoms in this sample. Um, so hopefully we'll get at least one more good view of something. And I can start that po picture and then we'll, we'll find somebody to raid. I would even accept a Nitzia at this point.
Some of these samples have hardly any diatoms. They're just mostly silt. So we might have to do some special processing when, uh, when the students go to analyze it. We might need to do something um, so they could have enough diatoms to actually get a record. Uh, because this isn't super promising. For some of these samples, there's just a few um, fragments of diatoms present. Uh, a standing, scanning electron microscope stubs are smaller than a typical microscope slide, though. So we usually see a little bit less material than you would see in a, uh, maybe like a third of the size or a quarter of the size of them. So it's sometimes challenging to uh, get enough material on there without it being so clumped and uh, dense that you can't actually see anything. But these are mostly silt. This one is for sure. It's a crazy piece of plant right here. You can see all of the cells. It's a giant fragment. Try running over to sample six. Let's see how dense the sample is um, in an attempt to try to get some diatoms present on it. And sometimes it's challenging to figure out how much material to put on a, a stub. So Mallory made these for me this morning and see how much of this stuff is actually just like silt, right? It's not a lot of diatoms present. Uh, typical lake sediments are a lot different. They're usually dominated by diatoms, so we don't have to go very far in our slides to actually see anything useful or interesting. Here we go, we got a little round guy. Yeah. Got a new follow. Thank you for that. Hang on. I will get to that in a second. As soon as I get this thing in focus. It's Cyclotella meningenina. Yeah. So let's zoom in. We'll get a nice high magnification focus. Somewhere in here. And then I'll just zoom back out a little bit. So one nice thing about the SCM is I get it in focus and, and I'm close. It stays in focus when I zoom out. So you can get it really sharply in focus when um, it's narrow, this little tiny area. Then the bigger image is always going to be in focus as a result. OK. Let's just go with this one. Got a nice clean image. A little bit of junk on it, but that's just normal for our river setting. And I can hop back in to the channel and say hello. Um, thank you for the follow, Avian Bob, Bird Bob. Um, what was the moment you knew you wanted to be diatomist? Well, I will save that for another stream, but uh, you want to grow up to be a diatom. Well, uh, if you clone yourself, give yourself uh, one of your clones to me and I'll put it in the SEM. Okay. Um, yeah, I need to get going. So um, 
I'm going to send us off to see somebody else. And uh, I have a whole bunch of things, or options for people I could send you to. Uh, let's see. I got a mostly not gross from Gorgana. Oh, um, let's just go with Numb the Geek. We haven't raided him in a while. Oops. It's super loud. Um, we will give a raid to Numb the Geek. He's one of my favorite musicians on Twitch. And um, you can hang out there and check out his music. Um, I like to do a little bit of non-science. Sometimes we raid uh, artists and musicians. So we're going to go with uh, Num the Geek. And then later on, maybe I'll, uh, I'll demand he play a song for me. So that'll be great. Um, okay. Well, it was nice to hang out with everybody. We've had a nice kind of chill afternoon stream from the SEM. We saw some pretty nice diatoms. I got some work done at the same time, which is always nice. The follows from Avian Bob and from KMRHSAF, just a bunch of random letters. Uh, 69 Tipsy, thank you for the follow. Um, Kuami, thank you for the follow. And 420 Zob69, thank you for the follow. So, um, also thanks to Dell and Pacific Plankton for hanging out in the stream and Mind of a Snail for, um, for coming to visit with us. And uh, all of our old friends, Tropical Geek and uh, Andalore and Kalathon. Um, thank you guys for, for coming, hanging out and visiting, juggling. It's nice to see you all here. Um, and Cursor Toy, Sir Toi, thank you also for, uh, for coming and hanging out. Um, Mama Bonbon bon as well. It's nice to see everybody. So, okay. Uh, we're going to go. All right. And I got to go anyway because I got to get ready for this uh, Zoom thing. So, um, everybody have a good day. And I'll see you again probably Saturday if we stream, which we should.